And so I'll get started here. Um, I, I, we've got about a half hour, I think, before we want to stop for questions. Is that about right, Dylan? Yeah, yeah, half hour, 45 minutes, whatever works for you is perfect for us. Okay, great. So a fun thing I like to do, and you can do this in the chat if you want while I'm talking, um, I love to ask people what watershed they live in. If you know, if you don't know, that's okay. Something to think about, because um, this is all going to be kind of talking about watersheds, and then also, of course, the steelhead. Um, but I'm going to give kind of a big, broad overview, um, more of an ecological perspective, just because I my background's a biologist, so I could talk for like two hours about the nitty gritty of steelhead specifically. But it's pretty easy to look up a lot of it yourself. Um, so I kind of want to give the bigger picture perspective that might be more helpful for you all as docents. Um, so, like I said, if you're interested, what watershed you live in? I live in the San Lorenzo River watershed, which is pretty cool. Um, so you guys can think about that if you'd like. But as Dylan said, um, City of Santa Cruz Water Department, we do, my group specifically does work doing environmental regulatory compliance. So that has to do with the um, permitting regulations that are in environmental regulations required to pull water out of the ecosystem to use as our drinking water. And then we also do source water protection. So that's protecting that water that we need so that it doesn't get polluted or contaminated and it's good quality. Um, so that's kind of like big, big ideas of all the stuff we do every day. So um, here's a quick chart of all of the, what we call anadromous streams in Santa Cruz County. Um, this map, I'll, I'll share a link with you in a couple minutes or at the end maybe. Um, this comes from the city of, or the county of Santa Cruz, available online. They have this really great data portal, um, which has a bunch of data that they've used or they've collected over like 20 years about steelhead and coho. Um, this map specifically is barriers, um, but a main thing, anadromous, that is, um, I have the definition up on the screen, screen migrating from rivers out to sea and then coming back to the river. So river, ocean river, that's an anadromous fish species. And we have at least three here in Santa Cruz County, which is steelhead trout, coho salmon, and also Pacific lamprey. So if you're out looking at the river in certain times of the year, these are all species you may see, except coho salmon, but we'll get into that later. So here's a zooming in to the just the San Lorenzo River watershed, because that's where at least Henry Cowell um, docents are going to be. And that's what you're going to go through the park. That's what you're going to be seeing. And that's the main river that everyone's going to see and talk about. Um, so that river is about 29 miles that goes from the beach boardwalk down in the city of Santa Cruz all the way up to Castle Rock State Park. 29 miles of it is accessible to steelhead and fish like that. There's even more of it that's even smaller. Um, and that doesn't include all the little tributaries. So some of the main tributaries we have are Brands of Forty Creek. We've got Zianti Creek. We've got Fall Creek, Boulder Creek, Bear Creek. Um, and there's lots of other smaller ones that are also accessible, which you can see on all those blue lines on there. Um, purple lines are kind of like what's accessible to coho salmon. They aren't quite as a as good swimmers as steelhead, so they, they can't make it quite as far up the watershed as the steelhead can. Um, so just to kind of give you guys an overview picture of what area we're talking about. So I'm gonna see in the chat, I see we've got a couple San Lorenzo watersheds, which is great. Awesome to hear that. Um, and it's super fun. I don't wanna get bogged down, but it's super fun if you know what sub watershed are you in like. Are you in the Zianti Creek watershed? Are you in the Bear Creek watershed, the Fall Creek? It's just kind of fun to see where everyone is and what is their watershed that they live in. Um, so thanks for sharing, I appreciate that. So next up, we're going to talk about stream flow. So this is something I deal with and look at kind of more on a day-to-day -day basis these days. Um, so this is a graph. Another website that you can just pull up easily online and you can play around with the data. It also shows what is flowing through the river right now at this exact time. Um, so what I did is I created a chart. This is from about December 2016 going all the way to the end of July, which is when I made the, uh, the chart here. 
And this is showing the USGS stream gauge that's located inside Henry Powell State Park. And you can see you really get a look at our weather patterns are shown really easily and really clearly on this chart. So those big tall spikes, that's all of our big winter rain events. And they're mostly between November and April. Those long downward tails, that's our super dry summer period. So the what we call the base flow of the river is going dropping down low, low, low. And that's usually May to October. Um, and then we call the... Santa Cruz Mountains, all of the streams are called flashy. And that's what happens. What that means is when we get rain, the streams rise up really high, really fast, and then they drop right back down really fast. They don't just kind of like get at a high level and stay there. They go up and spike back down again. Um, so this is a really cool like four year period or five year period because you can really see the difference between our, our what we call water years. Um, so if you look closely, you can maybe guess which one is maybe a wet year, which one's a dry year, and maybe what's more closer to normal. Um, so let me use my little fancy tools here. Or maybe not. Maybe I'm just going to uh, <laughs> use my mouse. So this guy, if you live locally, you remember this winter. This winter caused a lot of problems all over the mudslides, 17 roads closed, roads washed out, all of that stuff. That was a super extreme wet year. And then we've got this year. Our water year is not quite done, but you know we're not gonna get any more rain between now and October. So this one, as we know, and we're going through right now, a very, very dry year. And then this one kind of here, and this one kind of here, are more of the like slightly below average or normal years. This one was kind of a slightly above average. Um, so you can kind of see the difference just by looking at um, this, the graph of the streams. And we'll come back later to why that's kind of important for steelhead is knowing how the river fluctuates over the year. And there we go. Um, so I, I pulled those two years out, 2017, and 2021, the current, uh, so water years, they go from October to October, and that's just how it's done for this type of science. Um, but you can really see what I wanted to point out was the scale on these two graphs. You know, they both have spikes and a long leading edge, but the water year 2017, this is 20,000, which is cubic feet per second, which is how we measure water flow. And then this one on the 2021 was 2,000. So at least our peaks were 10 times higher in 2017, and there were a lot more of them than there were this past year. Um, so something to consider, and that has a big impact on the health of the ecosystem and the steelhead as they're coming through the water and the river. So since I work for the water department, Another quick plug, and I promise we're getting the steelhead soon. Um, this is also the stream flow and all these peaks and high water, low water is important because all of us in this area get our water that we drink from the river in some way or an aquifer, which is still influenced by our rainfall. Everything is from the rain. Um, so for the city of Santa Cruz, we get 95% of our drinking water from what we call surface water, not groundwater, not aquifers surface water, and 47% of that is from the San Lorenzo River. Um, and we also have a couple streams up north on Highway 1. Um, Scotts Valley Water District, if you live in that area, theirs is groundwater from the Santa Margarita Groundwater Basin. And then San Lorenzo Valley Water District, I don't know their percentages, but I know that they have a mixture of surface water from the San Lorenzo River watershed, as well as groundwater. Um, so we're all impacting that river, the water levels in the river, and then it's also impacted by how much rain and just the general weather that we have. So it's just all of these things working together, interacting with each other, creating this environment that the fish live in. Um, another thing I wanted to mention that's relevant to Henry Cowell is if you're walking along the Zianti Trail, you will see our big city of Santa Cruz, one of our water diversion structures in the river. Um, and so if you've ever wondered what that big cement structure is, that is one of the locations during the winter that we 
divert water from the river when the water level is higher, and it can be pumped up to Loch Lomond Reservoir for storage. So just a fun little fun fact for you all. And now we can get on to some steelhead. So quick, super quick history. Um, if any of you have lived in this area for a long time, you may remember um, back in the earlier, not necessarily the early 1900s, but maybe like the 1950s or 1960s. I've heard stories that that's kind of when there was still a lot of fish around. Early 1900s, especially, the San Lorenzo River was a hot spot destination for steelhead and salmon fishing. Um, my last job, when I did a lot more steelhead work, I talked to people all the time and I'd hear, you know, we could walk on the backs of the fish across the river. There were so many of them, or we could pitchfork them out of the river. There were so many of them. And I, you know, the first time I heard those, those quotes, I thought it was someone making a joke, but I heard the same exact quotes over and over and over again from different people. So I knew this was, this was a common thing that everyone was experiencing. But we get to the 1970s and those populations started to decline at that point. Um, and what that resulted in over an, as enough years in 2006, the California Central Coast Steelhead, which is kind of like a regional population um, that was listed as threatened under the California Endangered Species Act. And then Central Coast Coho Salmon, they were listed as endangered under the Federal Endangered Species Act and as well as the State Environment Endangered Species Act. Um, so the coho, I'm not going to focus on them too much because we don't really see them in the San Lorenzo River anymore. Um, they're in some of the smaller watersheds in our county, but at pretty really low numbers. Um, and they're kind of right on the verge there. The scientists kind of call them almost functionally extinct in our area at this point. Um, so focusing on steelhead instead, because you'll definitely see some steelhead in the river if you're out at the right time. So life cycle. This is the fun part the for me as the biologist. Um, so some of you may be familiar with the salmon life cycle, like we talked about, anadromous, where we go from the river to the ocean to the river. But I don't know if all of you know that this species, which is Oncorhynchus micus, if you like scientific names. Um, it's the same as a rainbow trout, same exact species, and they have two different life history strategies. So the freshwater strategy, which is when the fish stays their entire life in fresh water in the river, um, that's considered a rainbow trout. If that fish, for whatever variable reason, decides that it wants to go out to the ocean, it becomes a steelhead trout. And it's two names, two different life histories, but the same genetic, same species of fish. Um, so there's a lot of variability, like a rainbow trout can lay eggs and reproduce, and some of them will stay rainbows and some of them will become steelhead. It's not necessarily just a straight genetic component. Um, and the same goes for the steelhead. A steelhead can come back from the ocean, lay eggs, and some of those will become steelhead, but some of them may become rainbow trout instead. Um, it's just really interesting and still very much studied um, component of steelhead. And what's cool though, is it allows so much variability. If they have the option to do both, depending on what they're experiencing in their life, as well as some, some genetic um, influence. And that variability is great for animals um, and evolution and opportunities like that. Um, so kind of a cool thing to keep in mind when you see a rainbow trout, you see a steelhead, two sides of the same coin. Um, so I've got the life cycle diagram here, and I got a couple pictures of the different stages. So we've got the eggs that are laid in the river. Um, they kind of emerge into the little, these little guys called Alvin. And then they stay in this middle stage. This is what they look like in the river. Um, and they can stay in the river for one to two to three years before they kind of figure out their, or it's like determine what their life cycle is going to be, whether they're going to stay in the river or they're going to go out to the ocean. Um, if they are going to go out to the ocean, they turn this silvery color, they start heading downstream, they go to a lagoon, which is right at the kind of like edge of the ocean and the river. It's usually a mix of salt water and fresh water. Um, they get this nice silvery color, it's called smolting. Um, and then once they get big enough and the, the river opens up to the ocean, 
they can go straight out to the ocean and hopefully eat plenty of food and get really big and 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 come back as a great salmon with lots of eggs to, to continue on with life. Um, okay, checking my notes as we go to make sure I don't forget anything. Um, so yeah, basic looking at the life cycle. Um, some of these stages, the eggs last about, once they're laid, they last about, it takes about two to three months, depending on the water temperature before they emerge um, out of the gravel. And then, like I said, a couple, it could be one to a few years. It's always at least one year in the river before they head out to the ocean. Other species of salmon, that timeline of egg to ocean can be less. Um, species like king salmon or Chinook, they're born in the you know fall or winter the fall that like six months later they're heading out to sea they don't they don't stick around in the ocean or in the river very long um so that's some more variation just within the salmon and um, trout species so next up i've got some pictures so two sides of the same coin an adult rainbow trout and an adult steelhead trout um, and just keep in mind an adult steelhead trout is much bigger than an adult rainbow trout that you're going to see in a place like the San Lorenzo River. Um, the rainbow trout, they're going to maybe get about, you know, maybe this long, um, but an adult steelhead can be, uh, oh, I know the amount in centimeters, but not in feet. <laughs> Um, but they can get like a longer than my arm. Um, they get really, really big. They've been out in the ocean getting a lot of ocean nutrients. Um, so you, you'll know you're looking at a steelhead because it's going to be the biggest fish around and it's going to be this bright silvery color. So moving on, we'll talk a little bit about the habitat in the river that they live in. Um, so I'm not going to, I just found this diagram on the internet. Um, but what it's showing, I've got three different kind of, of the types, basic types of habitat in a river. You've got what's called a riffle, a run, and a pool. Um, a riffle is kind of those really shallow areas that are kind of noisy, and there's rocks that are exposed. Usually when people are trying to cross the river, they're crossing at the riffle because you can kind of hop along the rocks and not get your feet wet, hopefully. Um, a run is kind of a smooth, flat, straight area. The water's moving at a decent pace. It could be a little deep, but it's not super deep, but the water is moving at a very steady pace. And then we've got things like pools, which most people know what a, a stream pool would look like. The water's moving really slow. It's really deep or it has a deep spot. Um, and all of these three are important for steelhead for different reasons. Um, so a riffle, it's that fast moving shallow. When the fish are really teeny tiny, they like to hang out in those areas because just the bubbles and everything provides them with protection. Um, there's also, that's where all their food is. So these fish in the river are eating tiny little insects, what we call benthic macroinvertebrates. And I have a picture of that later, so you can kind of see what I'm talking about. But those invertebrates are eating algae that are on the rocks and the algae is growing from the sunlight that's hitting the rocks. So, you know, that shallow area is a perfect little ecosystem for all of those animals. When the fish start getting a little bigger and they can't really quite fit in that shallow area anymore, they move to the runs. Um, so their, their water still kind of move in, but they're close to the riffles, close to getting food. Um, and it's a, it's a good spot for them. When they start getting much bigger um, or just more adults or some of the bigger juveniles, um, they're going to move into the pools. That offers the most protection for them. Um, for a bigger fish, that could be spotted by a bird or something else. Um, and then you can, they can, are strong enough swimmers, they can swim around and, and move up and down and find food as they need it. Um, so, let me read my notes again. So the, the main thing that all these fish need and, and that is provided by these different habitats types. They all need cool water. Um, these fish do not do well in hot water or warm water. Um, so they like temperatures kind of in the 50 degrees zone, um, so pretty cold. They also need lots of oxygen, a lot more oxygen than a lot of other fish need. 
So those ripples and those areas where the water is moving and kind of getting turbulent and getting mixed up, that's helping introduce air and oxygen into the water. So another reason why those are really important in providing a healthy environment for the fish. And then they also need um, a lots of food, those, those invertebrates that I'll show you in the next slide. And they also need water connect connectivity. So like I said, these fish are moving around between these different habitat areas. They're not just sitting in one spot as they grow bigger. They need the ability to, if this pool is going dry or it's moving too slow or a tree fell in it, if something changes, they need the ability to kind of move around. And there's been studies that have tracked the fish as they move upstream and downstream and upstream and downstream throughout their life. Um, not super far necessarily, but within a decent range. So we have to make sure that we have enough water connectivity for the fish to be able to go about their lives in that way as well. And the last thing they kind of need is cover. I kind of mentioned that they're getting, they all have predators. Um, so things like this pool has a big log that's fallen in. That's going to provide what we call cover and protection for the fish. Things like big boulders, undercut banks, anywhere the fish can kind of hide and, and be safe from predators. So all of those different factors are very important um, for the stream ecosystem and supporting the steelhead. And the, oh, the adults, haven't talked about the adults. So when the adults come in, they use kind of a similar to a run habitat um, to lay their eggs. So that fast moving water is what is providing the eggs with oxygen so the eggs can incubate and be in a good spot. Um, and then once the eggs hatch out, they're kind of right in that zone that they need to be. Um, so again, that water moving, cool, clear water, very important. And even the adults, every stage of life is using these things in different ways. So I've got some pictures. Um, this is from my old job when I was doing what we call spawning surveys, which is looking for the adult fish and the nests that they lay in the gravel to lay their eggs. Um, so this kind of lighter, these are both, this one on the left is from the San Lorenzo River actually. The one on the right is not, but you get a good look at it. This light colored gravel, that's where the fish, the adult fish has kicked up the gravel with its tail and laid its eggs inside. Um, and you can really see it on the right here. We've got kind of this dug out spot here and it's dug out and flipped up all the gravel. So all the gravel is laying in a big pile in the water right here. And so the eggs are kind of laid right in that middle zone between the big pile of gravel and that little um, divot in the sand or the gravel where they dug it out. So just kind of a fun thing to look for sometimes if you're ever out by the river in kind of a shallower, like steadily moving zone. And then here I've got our macroinvertebrates. Um, so this one on the left, these are the good native types of species. Um, so we've got things like mayflies, stoneflies, caddisflies are really cool. They build their own little house out of materials um, from the, the stream. It could be leaves or rocks or sand. There's little beetles and also dragonfly larva. A lot of these are larva of flies and so they start their life in the stream and then they come out and emerge and become a flying insect. And then there's also things like snails and crayfish. Um, one thing that we do have to worry about in the San Lorenzo River is we have an invasive snail. Um, it's called a New Zealand mud snail. So you can see they're teeny tiny little snails. Um, this picture on the top I just took the other day, not in the San Lorenzo River, but in one of our other local streams that has this um, invasive species. And the problem is this little tiny invasive species, it, you can see, like, I don't know if you can tell, this rock has hundreds just hundreds and hundreds of these tiny little snails, and they outcompete the native macroinvertebrates for space and food. So when this invasive mud snail gets introduced, you eventually don't see any more of these native species. The only thing you see covering all the rocks is this New Zealand mud snail. And the steelhead, there's not enough like calories in a new, the mud snails for the steelhead to survive on. Um, so it's really not great for the steelhead when we have these invasive species. And that is one that is present in the San Lorenzo River watershed. And so there are ways you can look up. I don't want to get into it too much because we'll go over time, but it's really easy to look up the best way to avoid spreading it. And it has to do with making sure you have clean gear you, and you don't go from one watershed to another without 
cleaning your gear properly. And it's not hard to do. You just have to make sure you think about it before you do it. All right, so we're going to come back to our, uh, now we've, we've covered the life cycle, covered a little bits and pieces of steelhead life cycle. We're back to the stream flow graph. And so we're going to kind of put it all together now. Um, this is our big winter, 2016 to 2017. Um, and that was easier for this graph just because it's got those big spikes up high. So I put these little bars on here. Um, we'll start with this orange one. That one is when the adult fish are entering the river from the ocean to come up and lay their eggs. So that's about December to May or April, depending on how much water there is that year. Um, so that's the time of year if you're out walking in the river over the winter time, you might see these really big adult fish. So they're going to hopefully spawn and lay their eggs. It takes about two to three months for those eggs um, to incubate in, within the gravel. And so that's this green bar. You know, if, if a fish comes in at the early December, lays its eggs right away, then that one will incubate for about three months. And then, but if they lay their eggs in April, that one will take all the way to July while they're still in the gravel. Um, once they emerge from the gravel and now they're considered juveniles, that's going to be, you know, from March to about September. There's now all these little baby fish emerging and growing in the river. Um, we call those young of the year, and that's a kind of a science term. If you ever interact with fisheries people around here, you'll hear us say yoy, and that means young of the year. They're less than a year old. They're those little tiny fish that, and the first two fish that I showed you on the other fish pictures. Um, and then I put a big red bar on the bottom. That red bar is when they get to be a year or older than a year. They're staying in the river all year long, potentially for one year, two years, three years, potentially their whole life if they're going to be a rainbow trout. Um, and so that's, that's the whole year. It doesn't really matter what the flow levels are like. And we'll jump back up to this purple one. If some of these fish decide they want to go out to the ocean, their opportunity to leave and get to the ocean depends on the flow just as much as everyone else's, these other stages do. They have to leave while the river is open to the ocean. Um, if you've ever been down by the boardwalk in the summertime, you might notice that the lagoon fills up. It's not open to the ocean. It's closed off. So fish cannot leave during all times of the year. So while we're still getting these big flow spikes, and the river's open and connected to the ocean, that's when those fish are going to what we call smolt, like I said, and go out to the ocean and go become big adult steelhead. So bringing it, that was bringing it all back, you know, we depend on the river, they depend on the river, and we're all imp impacting it and interacting together. Um, I did want to add a little bit about the types of research that are done for steelhead. Um, the, the, I kind of just listed and have some pictures of the most common types. Um, one that we have here, you guys have at Henry Cowell, which you may not be aware of, um, kind of near the main entrance bridge is a pit tag array. Um, that's a, so a pit tag is kind of the same tag that you may have used for if you have a pet cat or dog, the little tag that you can scan, and it could have your phone number on it or same exact thing that we use for fish, funnily enough. Um, and you can just insert it into the fish. Um, and then this antenna, which is this picture right here, is in the water. And when a fish that's tagged swims over, it records the unique ID number on the fish. We can download the results and say, hey, this fish was caught on this date in this place. And now it's however much time later, and it passed over the antenna on this date on this place. Kind of a cool way to track them without having to actually physically catch them multiple times. Um, we also do things like snorkel surveys, um, which is a little different than snorkeling in the ocean. Um, we have these fun dry suits and, you know, maybe knee deep water. But it's a way of counting the fish in pools. Um, we have flashlights and everything. We do electrofishing, um, some people, and that's literally using electricity to shock the fish in the water. Um, most of the time, it doesn't hurt them um, permanently. Or, or fatally, but it's just enough to kind of shock them and they float to the surface and we can catch them in a net. Um, and then we can tag them or, or weigh them, measure them, do all that kind of stuff. It's a really good technique if you want to count exactly how many fish are in a pool versus some of the other methods you can get close, but never all. 
Um, this other picture is something that we do called seining. Um, this is done in more of like the big water lagoons. Um, and we have this big wide net um, that we set out and then we pull it in to shore or into the boat and we count all the fish that are caught in the net. Um, there's also different kinds of traps. Um, there's none in the San Lorenzo River right now, but Scott Creek north of us has a trap system. Um, I didn't have time to find pictures of everything, but there, there are traps that are physical barriers that have to be checked every day um, to count the fish. And then I wanted to give an example of one kind of more emerging research tool, um, which is called environmental DNA. Um, and I helped at my old job um, collect some data for a research paper. And basically everyone is shedding DNA, including fish, animals, organisms. So a piece of hair that falls off your head and onto the floor or outside on a trail can be considered environmental DNA. It's your DNA, it's just floating around in the environment. Um, so people are hoping, are looking to see if it's feasible to take a sample of water, test it for different kinds of animal DNA, and be able to say this species of fish or organism is present in this water just by, all I have to do is take a scoop of water. I don't have to see it. I don't have to go have cameras, nothing. So kind of emerging and new. Um, I don't have much information about it other than that. Um, so I'm going to wrap up here real quick. I have this, but I'm not going to get into it. It's basically the same as your dog and cat. Um, and how can we help? So the best way to help steelhead is to be a good river steward. We want to restore and maintain these river environments. And so some of the big things, we talked about water connectivity. We don't want to encourage people to build those rock dams and start ponding up the river. That's cutting off access for those fish to be able to move up and downstream and get to the places they need to go to survive and be healthy. Um, we don't want to cut down the riparian zone, which is the trees and the, and the plant life that lives right along the edge of the water. Those are providing shade, those are providing habitat for all the different things. Um, the shade helps keep the water cool, the tree falls in the river, it's creating um, cover. We don't want to spread invasive species like we kind of talked about. Don't dump or pollute the, the river. Um, you know, we always want to keep it clean, especially because we're all using it. It's not just the fish. We don't want to pollute for us either, for it's our drinking water. Um, there's lots of organizations in our area that do river um, restoration events. Um, I listed a couple here. Um, Coastal Watershed Council, Santa Cruz County Resource Conservation District. I'm sure there's more, um, but I didn't want to get into a whole list. And then maintaining good water quality. So that could be, you know, trails that are along the river, staying on the trail so that there's less erosion and sediment into the river. Um, and in, in San Lorenzo Valley, there's a lot of septic tanks. So if you or someone you know has septic tanks, making sure that those are in good working order is also important so that they're not leaching pollution and nutrients and all kinds of stuff into the river, because that can also affect that environment and ecosystem for the wildlife and us. So thank you. That's kind of my whirlwind uh, steelhead overview. Um, I kind of touched on a lot of topics, very surface level. So um, a lot of these things, I use very accurate scientific words. So if it's something is intriguing to you and you want to learn more, you should be able to pop that keyword into Google and find plenty of more information if, if it's of interest to you. So with that, I think we can do questions. And Marina, it, it might be easy to um, to actually take down the screen share. So maybe we can like sure. see one another. It, how does that sound? There you go. How about that? Well, I have a question. Sure. How many how many fish in the river? Ooh. Um I don't know exactly. <laughs> There's uh, how many steelhead in the river? Yep. I haven't heard a good estimate recently, um, but they're still considered threatened. They're not endangered. So there's, there are some out there, you know, I, you know, if you go out at the right time in the right spot, you won't, you'll almost certainly see some if you go out often enough. I, I don't want to say an exact number. There's probably a few thousand, um, but don't quote me on that. <laughs> 
I, I'm too much of a scientist. I want to know kind of really exact and I don't know off the top of my head, but um, they're, they're in trouble. They're threatened species, but they're not, it's not as dire as like the coho salmon. There's still some here. They're still coming back every year, the steelhead, um, but the, it could be a lot, a lot better. Um, and we don't want it to get worse is kind of the thing. So one of the questions I put in the chat room was, as I live on the river, <clears throat> Mm -hmm. and these very large kind of like bottom feeder fish. What are uh, those? Yeah, so that's probably a Sacramento sucker. Um, they go kind of like carp maybe and they swim really slowly and in, in big circles. So that's probably the second biggest fish you would see in the San Lorenzo River <laughs> compared to you have adult steelhead, which is really big. And then the Sacramento sucker is pretty big as well. And they, they move really slow and they're, they're kind of, yeah, bottom feeders. Mm -hmm. And is there any concern about them being in the river and the nope. environment at all? That's a native species. So that's, that's, they're meant to be here. Awesome. Koi, not Thank so you. much. I've seen some koi in the river before, um, but the Sacramento suckers are okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, do I, I have a question. Sure. Um, I, what are the principal theories about the, what causes the differentiation the developmental pathways of uh, steelhead and uh, yeah. rainbow trout? That's a great question that I don't have a really great answer for. Um, <laughs> there's been lots of research on it and there's still lots of ongoing research on it. So I'm pretty sure there is some level of genetic component to it, mm -hmm. like a, a steelhead offspring may be more likely to be a steelhead, um, but it's not 100%. And I think the more recent research, um, I, as far as I know, but I don't really, I'm, I don't really keep up with the research. I'm not that kind of scientist that keeps up on research like that, but they're looking into what's called epigenetics which is how does the environment impact our genetics in the sense of like, there's some genes and DNA pieces that can be turned on or off based on the environment affecting us and mm -hmm. behavior. And so, you know, maybe it's some, it could be something like we're in a really dry year, water year as an example. The fish that are in the river right now might start getting stressed out that there's so little water and they might say, hey, I need to get out of here. I'm gonna go out to the ocean because that's probably better than staying here and getting dried up in a pool. But I, hmm. I'm not an expert on that, but I think there's a lot of research of like, is it purely genetic? Is it kind of this environment affecting and putting pressure on the individual? Um, but that variability, regardless, is giving their, that it's just a great thing for the population as a whole to have that amount of variety. Mm -hmm. Your genetics are going out into all these different places and, and right. keep in the gene pool and, you know, evolution can act in all these different pieces. So mm -hmm. that's, we think, I, I've heard people speculate, that's why steelhead have done much better than coho salmon, because coho salmon have a much more rigid, they always follow, they have a very strict three year lifespan, they always go out to the ocean, they never stay in the river. And so if something bad happens to one year, that's it, like there's not very much variability within that to recover. Um, they're not very resilient in that way. But steelhead, there's some in the river, there's some in the ocean, there's some that stayed in the river for three years before going out to the ocean instead of leaving after one year. So it just, you know, it, it provides a lot more diversity to the population. What is the, are the principal um, predators for each stage of the uh, fish's development? Okay, so um, when they're small, juveniles in the river, um, birds, kingfisher birds, all kinds of birds are a big predator for them. Um, and that's why that cover in the mm -hmm. stream is very important. So we have things like mergansers, egrets, um, king, like I said, kingfishers, all these birds can, can get those species. Um, and things like raccoons maybe might be able to get some of the bigger ones if they can be patient enough. Um, the adults, their predators are going to be more I think out at sea, um, bigger mm. fish, orcas, things like that, sharks that would be eating um, big salmon. Once they come into the river, they're almost going to, and this I didn't mention it, 
the coho die when they go salmon die you know salmon die when they come back to the river and a majority of steelhead also die when they come back into the river after they laid their eggs a very small percentage of steelhead can actually head back out to the ocean and do a whole nother round um but once they're coming in most of them are dying and so they'll get eaten but they're not actively being hunted i don't think at that point not in this area there's no like bears around here that are going to go after big adult fish as easily um yeah that's what i can think of off the top of my head i have a question yeah go ahead oh my question oh okay hold on we've got two people um let's go with bill thank you um, I'm wondering how I can uh, help the tourists uh, see signs of the trout in the river, especially along river trail. Yeah, okay. What, what do I tell them to look for? So they have to be really patient um, and sit there. You know, good fishermen are, you know, very patient and sit quietly along the river. Um, same kind of principles apply. Um, the youngest fish in the summertime you'll be able to see around those shallow areas they won't be you won't be able to see them in those shallow areas that people tend to walk across but on the margins where the water starts getting flat um, and you can see through it you might be able to see the little ones um, the big ones um you have to wait till certain times of the winter um, when the when the water levels are falling and you just you have to be there at the right time in the right place it's kind of um hard to know exactly when they'll be there um but the the little ones you should be able to see periodically and you, you just have to kind of sit in a spot where you can see through the water and it's quiet and you're also just patient and, and looking for fish movement Uh, I would like to ask. I would like to ask you. Yeah. That when you have a three-year drought, what happens to the fish population? Can it come back? Does it decimate it? What goes? What goes on? What? Yeah. What makes it vulnerable? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, we're seeing right now kind of the impacts. We had this really long drought semi recently. Um, that we, you know, was four or five years long, and we, we kind of never got out of it. We had one or two wet years, maybe, but we're still back into the dry again. Um, my, my manager here likes to say that we're still in the same drought. Uh, we never left. We just had one wet year to kind of give us a little wash down. Um, but yeah, it's hard for those species. Um, we, we do see them coming back when there is water and they do have these other things that they need to help them survive. So it's, it's not, um, it's not, we're not totally knocking them out. They, you know, animals and populations are resilient. Um, they want to live, they want to survive, they want to reproduce. Um, but it does definitely hurt their population levels. It, it does go down. Um, but it, it just takes a little bit of time of good conditions for them to start coming back. So we did see a couple years so far of them coming back up from the drought. So I have a question on, you know, uh, you know, the crayfish or the crawdads. Yeah. You know, can you give us a little input on that? I see a lot of folks, unfortunately, going out there fishing for them, flowing yeah. them out of the river. Yeah, so I've kind of heard mixed things, um, and I'm definitely more of a fish steelhead expert <laughs> than a crawfish expert, but um, there's a lot of them out there, and I know people fish for them. I've heard that the ones that we mostly see around here are actually an invasive crawfish, um, but the native ones that we used to have are also mostly gone, um, so it, it may just be they've been kind of replaced with this other species of crawfish, um, so I don't I don't think that's an issue that they're here. Um, I don't get the sense there's too many of them or they're having a, a major impact. They're mostly like bottom feeders as well. They're not really actively hunting usually. They're picking up dead things um, along the bottom mostly. So they make a huge meal out of the steelhead carcasses when they die. Lots of little crawfish all over those as soon as it floats to the bottom of the pool. Um, so they're, they're doing an ecosystem service as well. Do the uh, New Zealand uh, mud snails have any natural predators at all? Not around here, as far as I know. Um, 
And I just heard and was sent an article about a little fish that we have, another endangered fish actually, that we have in the lagoons um, called a goby, but apparently they can eat them and, it, and it's enough nutrients for them. But I, I haven't actually read the paper yet. Um, but the main thing is that those New Zealand mud snails, the steelhead can't get enough nutrients out of them. Even if they eat hundreds of them, they like can't, they, the snails are like so small and protected in their shell that they just pass right through the fish and nothing gets digested. Mm. But then the snails outcompete all those other invertebrates. And so the steelhead kind of have a more limited food sources. Um, but yeah, mm. as far as I know, no real predators out here, which is part of the problem. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, Marina. Yes. Um, I, I'm curious if there's any research on the success rate of uh, undisturbed gravel bars and um, and runs compared mm -hmm. to disturbed gravel bars and runs. Uh, what do you mean by disturbed? Like, if people are walking in the river, um, oh. if people and dogs are walking in the river mm -hmm. and disturbing disturbing mm -hmm. the river bottom and the gravel bars there. Um, yeah. are there statistics? Um, I don't know any statistics, but what I can say about, um, the gravel bars and what's used, um, for the fish, the fish that are laying their eggs, um, generally they're laying. So the problem is that we want to avoid the most is people walking on those, but the, the areas that the fish will have their eggs, hopefully is going to be wet. It's going to be underwater. It may only be under, you know, this much water. But it should be underwater the whole time and hopefully that will discourage at least some people from walking through them. Um, so dry gravel bars in the summer, uh, not that big of a deal because they're, you know, the fish are laying their eggs in the middle of winter when the flow is going up and down and up and down all the time. Um, but if people are walking around in the shallow water where the fish have laid their eggs, that can be a problem. Um, as far as like just literally crushing the eggs. Um, so Dylan, how do we educate folks about that? I mean, we have so many people in the river. Yeah. Um, but how do you have tons of people in the winter time walking through the winter or is it mostly during the summer? It's mostly during the summer. Um, I, I... So that's a less of a concern. Um, mm -hmm. and it is, you know, the winter times when the eggs are in the gravel to through early spring. Um, and I, yeah, you guys know who's walking through the river, but, um, it's, it's a hard, education is hard when people don't know. I know a lot of places have educational signs um, and people who don't know what to look for, you know, they may miss it. They might not notice what they're stepping on it, but that's, I mean, that's just kind of how it goes. Um, if you, if you all learn to what to look for and you see one, you can point it out and tell people to avoid walking in that area. But I don't want to say to never walk in the river ever because that's not realistic. So it's, just, it's something good to be aware of. And if you're interested in learning how to identify those, um, again, it's something that you can look at pictures online and get practice by just going out along the river and seeing what you can see. Um, the main stem San Lorenzo during really wet years doesn't have as many of those nests because the water level gets so high. Um, it kind of washes them out. The, the fish are more interested in some of those tributaries that aren't quite as extreme with the water levels. Another question I have, how specifically do you clean off your gear when you're moving from one watershed to another? And are there any tributaries that um, you and other agencies are specifically watching because there aren't any records of mud snails? Um, so the main watersheds, San, uh, San Lorenzo, Aptos, Soquel, all have mud snails. Um, some of the small streams north of town do not have mud snails. Um, so if there's a fish and wildlife, if you just like Google aquatic invasive species, they have a whole list of the, the ways, the different methods for decontaminating gear. Um, some of the options are freezing, some of them are boiling them in hot water, and some of it is using like chemical um, cleaners. Um, we usually just tend to freeze our gear. Um, that's usually you freeze it overnight and, and then try to let it dry out as much as possible. Um, but it's, you kind of want to just work under the assumption that everywhere has them and you don't want to bring them anywhere else. Because if you go in with that mindset, you're not going to spread them. Because once you see the snails, it's too late. They're already there. 
you know, there's no way of like seeing them before it's too late. So it's one of those things you just have to be very proactive about it. Um, also, um, most of the snails are more concentrated in the lower watersheds closer to the ocean, lower parts. So if you're going from the bottom, like around here, and then you're going all the way up to the top of the watershed at the top of the Santa Cruz Mountains, it may be good to like clean your gear there too. So hopefully you're not bringing more up higher. Um, or if you start do something up here and first and then come back down lower and you're prevent you're like hopefully not spreading it more than where it already was. And that's available like aquatic invasive species, uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, you can look it up the details online. The city of Santa Cruz is planning to relocate the pipeline from Loch Lomond to Graham Hill Water Treatment Plant. How does the water pipeline run from the high voltage pumps by the rubber dam over to the Zioni pumping station? Um, I'm not uh, super familiar with all of the distribution system, unfortunately. So I, I do a lot of the environmental work and I actually started at the city um, in November 2019 and we very quickly stopped doing things like tours of the system in big groups. So I haven't really seen everything yet, even though it's been a while. Um, but yeah, there is some work that's going to be one of our capital improvement projects is improving some of our pipelines, um, but I don't know the specifics about that in particular. Do you, do you know what will happen to the pipeline under Pipeline Road? Will it just be abandoned when they move it to Graham Hill Road? Um, I, I don't know. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I, there's a, a lot of that stuff is still kind of in the works. There may be information somewhere online, the city website. Um, but uh, yeah, we're, we're pretty separate groups. Um, and a lot of times I hear about the projects only when they're actively under construction. And I don't really get a lot of the, in the before information while it's still under design and all of that um, because things would change and they don't want us to give out you know in, uh, inaccurate information. Those gobies, are they native? They are um, tidewater gobies. And they're mm -hmm. the mudfish that kind of half crawl out of the mud? They or do they... live in the mud, that's right, yep. Oh. Thank you. You're welcome. Can you tell us how the uh, septic uh, effluent has been measured and, and how we can find out whether it's going up or down depending on like what happened in the wildfire and things like that? Yeah, so um, I know the county of Santa Cruz has a, um, they go out and do a lot, a lot of water quality testing. Um, I don't recall how much of that is available online, but I do know that I think some of it is. Um, I'm trying to remember if I can remember the name of the program specifically. But they're testing for things like E. coli and um, fecal col coliform and things like that, which are pretty much going to be from a septic systems and things like that. Um, so they they do test about they do testing the county. Um, so that so maybe should we ask? Testing. Sorry. Should we ask environmental health? Yeah, Is that's that the group that does it. Yep, environmental health. Um, they they would know. Thank you. So maybe a few more questions, um, and if you have more, um, we can maybe figure out a way to get them to me, or I can give you some more resources to look at. This has been, well, I just want to let you know, this, this has been very informative, very wonderful. You've done a great job. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. I, yeah, I, thank I you. have to try really hard to tone it down because I know I, I like know too much <laughs> and to try and to not get into the nitty gritty is, is hard sometimes, but thank you. No, any more questions? No more questions? Well, right. One last question. Um, sure. I understand that the Loch Lomond was, uh, planting trout, but they were not native and they, they used trout that couldn't reproduce. Mm -hmm. And so are there any steelhead in Loch Lomond? So there are rainbow trout that are in Loch Lomond and the creek that flows into Loch Lomond is called Newell Creek. 
there are rainbow trout in Newell Creek above the dam. That, that stream before it got dammed was accessible to steelhead and accessible to rainbow trout. So um, yes, Oncorhynchus micus, that species does exist in that upper part of the watershed above the dam. Um, there are not gonna be any steelhead because they can't go out to the ocean from there. Um, and that's what determines that they're a steelhead or not. The fish that are planted um, as part of like the fishing program, that's through the Department of Fish and Wildlife, those fish are genetically, basically genetically engineered fish. They, I think they have like an extra chromosome or something like that. They're called triploid fish. Um, and that makes it so that they're unable to reproduce. And so that's what maintains, you can plant fish and not worry about the genetics of these hatchery fish influencing the native species. Um, and so that's pretty much how those types of fishery plants are work these days, I'm pretty sure. How far, how far can fish uh, steelhead migrate up the San Lorenzo River? What's the limit? Castle Rock. Castle Rock? Castle Rock State Park. They can go all the way up. That map that I showed at the very beginning that had all the little blue lines all the way to the top of the Santa Cruz Mountains, they can go all the way up there. Did they climb the walk? Did they climb the walk? No. <laughs> Hey, they probably wish they could, but not quite. It's just as, as far as they can swim. <laughs> Marina, we are all so, so fortunate that you're able to, to join us and be here with us tonight. And we're so appreciative of your time and all the knowledge that you've shared with us. So, so thank you so, so, so much. You're welcome. It was great talking to everyone. Thanks for your great questions. Um, yeah, and I hope that it was helpful for you when you talk to visitors. If you have additional resources, I would love them. We're always looking for, for resources that we can use when speaking to park visitors and stuff. So that would be phenomenal. Okay, yeah, I'll send you a couple of the links that I kind of pulled information from. Um, and then you can kind of share it with everybody. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank, thank you. you.